variables that affect our heart rate. And on the previous slide here, you can see we were talking about the positive chronotropic agents. Remember this awesome picture here? This picture will be very beneficial. I seriously, seriously suggest that you um, learn this picture. Right? Try to really understand uh, uh, what you're seeing here. And in a general sense, you kind of do. And that's why in chapter 17, it was very helpful to go over to secondary messenger system because you can see all right, the secondary messenger system in, in, in all of its glory, if you want to call it. But doing what it does here, you can see the importance of kind of having a, a general understanding of that. Also, you can see the importance of epinephrine and norepinephrine. Those are basically going to be neurotransmitters that are going to stimulate these beta-1 adrenergic receptors to then activate the G protein, starting that secondary messenger cascade system. Essentially, opening up these calcium ion channels here so we can get more calcium inside of the cell so we can depolarize the cell much more effectively there. Okay, so kind of keep that in mind. This one thing will not get off my screen and it's annoying me. Okay, there it is, it's gone. Okay, so we talked about the different types of positive chronotropic agents last class, thyroid hormone, caffeine, nicotine, and cocaine. I just read an interesting study today in regards to caffeine, um, where, again, it, it's just one uh, uh, of studies that are starting off uh, on this topic, but one was, uh, the one study said that if you drink up to three cups of coffee, that it is actually going to decrease your cardio morbidity rates, you know, the chances of you um, having issues with uh, heart problems like hypertension, cardiomyopathy, all sorts of other conditions. And then I read another study today that if you drink four or more caffeinated beverages, i.e. like Red Bulls, energy drinks, or coffee, then that can have a significant impact on your uh, cardiovascular health and heart health in regards to uh, blood pressure, heart rate. Uh, and they've done some studies there. Again, it's just it's one smaller study, so they're still kind of working the kinks out, but I just found it interesting there, and I thought I'd share that with you. Okay, so let's move on to the next topic here, the negative chronotropic agents, all right? So we saw with the sympathetic system, we had the, the positive uh, chronotropic agents that will increase the heart rate. Well, of course, our negative chronotropic agents here will do the opposite, and they will decrease the heart rate. So, of course, you know with the autonomic nervous system, you have that antagonistic relationship between the sympathetic and the parasympathetic. So much to the same here, right, with our negative chronotropic agents, we are going to be utilizing the parasympathetic division of the autonomic nervous system here. So again, going back to chapter 15 and kind of digging up some of that information that I know that's stored in your brain somewhere, right, that the neurotransmitter on the parasympathetic neurons for the postganglionic lower motor neuron, right, we're going to use acetylcholine. And we're pretty familiar with acetylcholine, right, way back from chapter 10 when we were learning about its use on skeletal muscles. It was the neurotransmitter in skeletal muscles that's always excitatory, right? That's something that you may not have really stressed, but acetylcholine is always excitatory as a neurotransmitter when it's used on skeletal muscles, here, we're going to see it in a different light here, all right? In this case, we're going to, with acetylcholine, we're going to see acetylcholine bind with a different type of receptor. These are called muscarinic receptors here, which are essentially our potassium channels, all right? So here's what we're going to do. We're going to open up our potassium channels. You know where potassium is going to go, banana floating in the ocean. It's going to go from an area of high concentration to low concentration, so it's going to leave the cell. So, of course, when those ions leave the cell, they take their positive charge with it. They make the inside of the cell more negative. If you do not recall what that is called, that term, when you make the inside of the cell more negative, it's called hyperpolarization. Hyperpolarization. So, what does that mean? It's going to take these nodal cells longer to reach that threshold value, right, for, okay, the, the, the cell to uh, deliver an action potential. So if it takes longer to get to the threshold, then that means all right, it'll our heart rate will drop and slow down in the meantime here. So that brings us to the beta blocker uh, uh, drugs that I was telling you about. 
And so these classes of drugs, literally, if you look at the name beta blocker, right, we go back to our picture here, these drugs are going to affect these receptors here, those beta-1 adrenergic receptors. And so essentially, it's going to block the binding site for norepinephrine and epinephrine. So those neurotransmitters right, will not be able, they won't be able to um, stimulate the secondary messenger system there. And then therefore, heart rate down. And if we slow the heart rate down, we can drop our blood pressure down. If you all remember, right, blood pressure is equal to heart rate times total peripheral resistance. So if we drop the heart rate, we can drop the blood pressure. So that's the fun uh, and interesting part of beta blocking drugs. Um, continuing on here with some more of the variables that influence our heart rate, right? We introduced you to the concept of reflexes in 210. And back in chapter 14, you were learning about spinal reflexes. And there's various different types of reflexes, but we didn't really focus too much on our autonomic reflexes. Well, this class, you are going to see a lot of autonomic reflexes. And so we're going to discuss some of these autonomic reflexes, obviously meaning we're going to utilize our autonomic nervous system in that scenario. But think about this. When we're talking about a reflex, four things that you need for a reflex. You need a stimulus which is going to be a change in the internal or external environment. You're going to need a receptor to monitor that change. Then the control center, which is going to figure out what the heck is going on and then figure out what kind of outcome is going to result from that stimulus. And then, of course, our effectors, which are always going to carry out that change or the, the effect or whatever command that the control center has decided to initiate. Um, and it is going to either, the effector is either going to be a muscle or a gland. So we talked about glands earlier this semester. Now we're going to be talking about our effectors as muscles, specifically the cardiac muscles here. So when we're discussing our autonomic reflexes, the receptor types that we were going to pretty much be discussing are going to be our stretch or baroreceptors and then our chemoreceptors. So they're going to be sending that sensory input information to the cardiac center in the medulla oblongata. And then, as you know, we have the cardio inhibitory and the cardio acceleratory center. So depending on what all right, uh, type of effect is going to occur, we'll determine which division we're going to utilize, whether it's going to be the sympathetic division or the parasympathetic division of the autonomic nervous system here, right, to change what our cardiac output is going to be, depending on what's happening here. So let's talk about the Bainbridge reflex, also known as the atrial reflex. Right. Seems like a pretty decent reflex to have. You know, it keeps your heart from bursting like a water balloon if you put too much water in it here. And so this is where we, we, we talked about this on the endocrine side when we were discussing um, how the um, AMP, the atrial natriuretic uh, peptide there, uh, will be the hormone that's released from the heart there when there's overfilling of the heart or when blood volume increases. Well, similar type of situation here, the baroreceptors inside of the excuse me the baroreceptors inside of the atrial walls there will be stimulated as more blood volume right increases so that what we call venous return and so those signals will then be transmitted to the cardio acceleratory center and so in response to that increase in blood volume from that increased venous return the cardio acceleratory center is then going to stimulate the heart through the sympathetic nervous system to increase the heart rate so we can move that blood through the heart faster. Get it out of there. All right. So if we increase the heart rate, we cannot fill up the atria as much because by the time right, the heart is contracting, we haven't finished filling up those chambers so we can move blood through the heart faster. <clears throat> so that's our goal when we are, you know, in the situation with the Bainbridge reflex of overfilling our heart. So that is going to be one of the uh, variables that is going to affect notice heart rates. Our positive and negative chronotropic agents will be some of the other ones. 
And then we have variables that influence the stroke volume. So before, and I'm hoping this is going to work, right? So stroke volume, SV, is going to be equal to R. And, come on, please work for me. End diastolic, ah, end diastolic, EDV. All right, minus ESV. Ah. That looks awful. It's really hard to do this with my mouse, y'all. But I think I know how to, what I'm doing wrong. Nope, guess I don't. Okay, so stroke volume, <laughs> read it as best you can. All right, is equal to end diastolic volume minus end systolic volume. It's just the difference between those. And if you all remember, the end diastolic volume is the amount of blood in the ventricles um, just before the ventricle contracts. And then the end systolic volume is the amount of blood left over in the ventricle after the ventricles have contracted and pushed some of the blood out. All right, so the blood that leaves those ventricles is going to be the stroke volume. So there's three things that is going to influence our stroke volume. One is venous return. And we'll talk about that here in a second. Ionic tropic agents. Okay, notice this is similar in, not in spelling, but it's a similar word to chronotropic, but ionotropic is a little bit different. And then afterload, we're going to walk through all of these. So let's define what venous return is. Amount of blood that's coming back to the heart. So here's the thing, and we talked about this briefly before, right? That venous return should be directly related to stroke volume. So essentially, if you're pushing out 70 milli milliliters of blood on each, all right, uh, contraction of the heart, then essentially that same amount of blood should be returning to the heart. And if you increase the stroke volume, you should increase. The, the venous return here. So essentially, I want you to think of it not so much as the volume, right, per se, but understand that if you increase stroke volume, so if you're getting more blood leaving the heart, you're going to get more blood returning to the heart and vice versa. If you get less blood, right, leaving the heart, you'll get less blood returning to the heart. All right, so keep that in mind. All right, so when we're looking at our stroke volume, not, excuse me, our venous return, Right, we're going to use this value here, the end diastolic volume. Right, and so we refer to venous return as the preload. So the preload is going to be the amount of blood sitting there inside of those chambers prior to the heart contracting. Right. And so I'm going, to, I'm going to talk about some of these concepts here in a second, but let's just kind of learn, all right, just some of these terms here. Right. So the amount of ventricular blood prior to contraction, which is the end diastolic volume. So if you increase the end diastolic volume, you're going to increase what we call the preload. And the preload is that kind of stretching that the volume of blood is exerting on the heart walls and the ventricles, all right, prior to the heart contracting. <clears throat> all right, so that brings me to a very, very, I'm going to say it one more time, very important concept called the Frank Starling Law. Right, and this is where, remember I was telling you about how we want to get that maximal optimal overlap anytime that we're dealing with striated muscle tissue, whether it's cardiac muscle or skeletal muscle, right? But when we're dealing with striated uh, muscle tissue, because that's str those striations come from the overlap there, those uh, um, the actin and myosin protein fibers there. And so essentially with our Frank Starling law, right? If we, as we increase the end diastolic volume, as we start to get more blood that's in the ventricles prior to contraction, then the heart wall will stretch more. Think of it as filling a water balloon. The more water you put into that balloon, the more it's going to stretch out. And so what will happen is, all right, up to a certain point, we're going to get more overlap as the heart wall stretches out. But remember the example that I showed you in class with my fingers there, right? Eventually, if you overfill it, then we move those actin and myosin filaments further and further away from each other. You'll get less overlap there. 
So there's a sweet spot in there. And that's what I was explaining to you. I called it the Goldilocks effect. We wanted to be right in the middle, not too much overlap, not too little overlap. So in this situation, we can get too little overlap if we keep filling up the heart with more blood. And so the Frank Starling law is a wonderful concept because what will happen is, right, as the heart is filling up, all right, this con this the, the Frank Starling law allows the heart to contract. Now, this is important, much more forcibly, right, as more blood is pouring into the, the chambers, the ventricles there. Again, but if we overfill it, then we start to lose that. So there's going to be that sweet spot there where we get that optimal overlap of the actin and myosin. And so that allows the heart then when it contracts, right, to contract much more efficiently and forcibly, right, to push out an even more blood during the stroke volume. So increase the end diastolic volume. There's a direct correlation here. Increase the end diastolic volume increases our stroke volume. Okay, and that's based on our Frank Starling law. All right, so the next concept here, venous return may be increased by increased venous pressure or increased time to fill. So when you're exercising, for example, and you're working out, right, your skeletal muscles contract and relax, contract and relax more than they are probably right now as you're sitting there watching this video or if you're listening to me live. And so remember, our veins have valves so we don't get a backflow. So when your muscles are contracting, when you're, say, running or doing whatever, right, that's going to push more venous blood back towards the heart. As that occurs, right, you are going to increase your venous pressure because those skeletal muscles are pressing on the veins and moving that blood through the venous system here. And so in this situation, right, we're going to see, right, in order for us to increase our stroke volume, now we're going to see a lowering and slowing of the heart rate, right? And you'll see this in uh, that, one athlete I was telling you about, Miguel Indurain, and, and, and a lot of professional or Olympic caliber athletes there, right? Their hearts, because they have gotten bigger through working out and whatnot, right? Their heart rate normally will drop a little bit more at resting heart rate. So that gives, right, the heart more time, those chambers more time to fill with blood returning from the venous system. So when it contracts, Right, we're able to, again, utilize the Frank Starling law because we had a little bit more extra time to fill so we could get more um, end, uh, more end diastolic volume blood into those ventricles to push out right, that extra blood. And therefore, we increased all right, our stroke volume in that regards there. All right, so what happens all right, with our venous return now if we, go, we can see a decrease all right, venous return. When we have uh, a dehydration situation going on, when our blood plasma volume has decreased a little bit, in the example here, a hemorrhage, right? So we'll see a decreased venous return, right? When our blood volume decreases or we have an increase in heart rate, like I was saying before, right? If we have an increase in the heart rate, we give the chambers less time to fill. So that will then therefore decrease our end diastolic volume there. So when we have a smaller preload, which is our EDV, the end diastolic volume, we're gonna see a smaller stroke volume. So that goes back to here. <clears throat> um, right here, venous return, directly related to stroke volume. So if venous return decreases, Stroke volume decreases, and that's pretty much what I'm repeating here. <clears throat> right, our, de our stroke volume, excuse me, our venous return decreased, therefore the stroke volume has decreased, and that's our preload. So keep in mind, like what I was saying before, all right, you're going to have, right, your right and left sides of your heart 
when they're contracting, they're going to be essentially pushing out right, the same volume. So if we said the stroke volume in the left ventricle was 70 milliliters, then the stroke volume in the right ventricle should be the same. And so that's what we want to see here. We want to have a nice balanced ventricular output. And that is mainly done, right, due to this Frank Starling law. So even if you get, all right, a little bit more blood, let's say we, we get a little bit more blood from the right atrium, all right, that's going to go into the right ventricle compared to the left atrium, and the left ventricle. So let's say we get about 10 millimeters more on the right side than the left side. Well, the heart is going to try to compensate for that through that Frank Starling law because we're going to get that optimal maximum overlap between the actin and myosin. So that right ventricle is going to contract a little bit more forcibly than the left. So it can push out that extra blood, again, trying to balance itself out. It's going to try to right the ship, right? You're on a canoe and you start leaning to the, the, the canoe starts to tip to the right. You start to lean to the left a little bit to right the ship. Same thing here, right? Our heart, it will do the same. One ventricle might pump a little bit harder, right? On one contraction to, to try to get rid of that extra blood that just got, that, that just came back here, right? And so that's basically what we're looking at here. Okay. Um, there's a lot of stuff here. This stuff, I, it's fascinating. This is one of my favorite chapters. So I really enjoy um, the, the cardiac chapter here. Okay, so sticking on with the variables that influence the stroke volume, there was three of them, I told you. The venous return was the first one. The second one here is the ionic tropic agents. So again, they're going to influence our stroke volume due to, all right, how they affect how forcibly the heart contracts. So how do we do that? We're going to bring in more calcium. If we can get more calcium to come in, we can get more cross bridges to form. Because remember, calcium is gonna remove the troponin tropomyosin complex off of the myosin binding sites on actin. So if you have a lot of cal, if you don't have, a, if, you, if you get a little calcium coming in, yeah, you're gonna uncover some of those binding sites, but you're not gonna, uncover as many as you, you, you can with a lot of calcium. And so that's what we're going to see here. So like that third uh, uh, bullet point there says, calcium levels directly relate to the number of cross bridges that are formed. So what that means is more calcium, more cross bridges form. Less calcium, less cross bridges form. So we have our positive and our negative ionotropic agents. So obviously the positive are going to increase calcium. And so we saw how epinephrine and norepinephrine is going to stimulate the beta-1 adrenergic receptors, right, to open up, activate that G protein, and then start to uh, influence that secondary messenger system to open up those calcium bridges, or, or excuse me, those calcium channels there. And then thyroid hormone, if you recall that one page there where everything was written in red, they start to increase the number of beta-1 receptors. So those thyroid hormones are, is, is actually going to stimulate the cell to uh, increase its protein synthesis of those beta-1 receptors and put them into the plasma membrane there. All right, so we have, okay, this drug here, digitalis, I don't have too many patients that take digitalis here, right? But digitalis is going to increase your cardiac output right, by making calcium more available. <clears throat> All right, negative ionotropic agents there. Okay, obviously, these are going to be the ones that are going to decrease calcium coming into the heart there. And so basically, what do they do here, right? Well, we're going to see if we can't get as much calcium coming into the cell, it can take, all right, a longer time, right, for that cell to depolarize and also to remove, right, we'll have fewer cross bridges that are going to, to, to form there. And so some of the negative ionotropic agents, right? You can get electrolyte imbalances going on. Okay, so negative ionotropic agents. You heard me talk about that drug uh, uh, class called uh, calcium channel blockers. And again, literally, this is one of the few times where whoever was naming stuff 
decided, hey, I'll make it easy on people. And we named the, the, the drug class after what it does. So essentially, you're going to get, right, this drug is going to block, right, those calcium channels from opening up, right, and allowing, and prevention of allowing um, calcium from entering into the cell. Now, I can't remember off the top of my head if the calcium channel blockers mess up or interfere with the secondary messenger system, or if they actually just block the binding site on the secondary uh, on the calcium channel. I can't recall exactly how it works. At one point I did know, but I apologize. I cannot recall off the top of my head. All right, so the final variable for stroke volume influence is gonna be afterload. And so afterload is pretty much going to be, know this definition, the resistance, the resistance in the arteries to ejection of blood by the ventricles. So really, you know, when we talked about the ventricular ejection uh, phase on the cardiac cycle there, so that when blood initially gets pushed out of the ventricles into the arteries, it'll be initially right there in the pulmonary trunk in the aorta. And that's considered the afterload, okay? So that blood is going to create some resistance until it moves through the circulatory system. Initially, um, it will, um, create some resistance to blood that is going to be pumped out of the heart on the next contraction there. So essentially, and we all know this with pressure gradients, the pressure inside the ventricles has to exceed the pressure in the arteries, right? In order for the semilunar valves to open up and for blood to leave the ventricles and go into the arteries there. So if we increase the pressure or our afterload in those arteries in the pulmonary trunk and in the aorta, then now those ventricles have to, in, 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 in addition to the, 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 the volume of blood that's just sitting there, right, and the resistance that that offers, now it has to contract even harder to move that blood, all right, down and through the circulatory system. So if we increase the resistance in the arteries, we increase the afterload, which means we have to increase the force of contraction right, in the ventricles to push that blood, to overcome that pressure, right, so we can open those semilunar valves there, right, and so one of the things, and I've seen this on tests before, right, atherosclerosis, that plaque buildup in some of your blood, blood vessels, this will increase the afterload, so we see this in the older population here, or we'll see it, all right, now imagine, right, you've got this plaque building up in these blood vessels, and now imagine these blood vessels undergoing vasoconstriction. So couple that vasoconstriction with the plaque, now we've increased the resistance even more. So as a result, it's going to be harder to eject blood out of the ventricles, and that can negatively influence stroke volume. It can decrease stroke volume. So make sure that you understand what I'm about to say here. Write it down or type it, whatever, right? If you increase the afterload, you will decrease the stroke volume. One more time, increase the afterload, decrease stroke, stroke volume, because we've made it tougher to eject the blood out of the heart, because we've increased the resistance there in the arteries for whatever reason, atherosclerosis, increased blood volume, whatever, right? And so the heart needs to overcome that increase resistance. And if it doesn't, it can start to decrease the stroke volume. Okay, so I, here you can see a nice picture here talking about end diastolic volume, end systolic volume, and then our stroke volume here. And so you'll notice venous return, number one, is the amount of blood that's coming back right into the heart, right through the left and right atria there. Our ionic, our ionotropic agents here, which are gonna alter the contractility of the heart, either increase it or decrease it. That will affect primarily the ventricles. And then our afterload is the resistance in the arteries, in the pulmonary trunk here and in the aorta. So reminder, here's a picture of the end diastolic volume. That's the amount of blood, right? That's going to be in the ventricles prior to the ventricles contracting. And then the end systolic volume is the amount of blood left over in the ventricles after they contract.
And then obviously the stroke volume is the amount of blood that gets ejected out of the heart on each contraction. And that's just the difference between the end diastolic volume and the end systolic volume here. So this picture here is showing us that Frank Starling law. Okay, so keep in mind, all right, where do we want? We want the Goldilocks effect. So that is going to be number four here. That's the most optimal amount of overlap. You can see here we have too much overlap. Okay, and then we start to decrease that overlap a little bit and we decrease even more, but this is representing, right, number four here is going to be the optimal overlap here, which is going to allow for a much more forcible contraction. And you can see it's representing here. So number one is this little line here. We're not getting a really hard contraction in the heart. And then when we start to um, decrease that uh, excessive overlap, you'll see we start to increase the force of contraction here all right, till we get to number four, and this is considered to be the optimal overlap. So that's what we want to see. So as the heart is filling, we're going to effectuate the overlap between the actin and the myosin. And you're gonna to get to a point, that sweet spot there, that one range there where there's, all right, tons of actin, myosin, all right, overlap. So when we're able to initiate, all right, a muscle contraction, when we inject calcium into that, into that uh, system, then we can get um, a nice cross bridge, or I shouldn't say a nice, we're, we're gonna get many, several, multiple increased uh, cross bridge formation occurring because of the calcium is going to allow us to do that. And so that's what we're shooting for with our Frank Starling law, right? that optimal overlap there. All right, so this picture here is just kind of a little bit of review here, variables that influence stroke volume for venous return here. And if you go through the steps here, it kind of explains it to you. So as we start to increase, all right, the volume of blood that's being returned to the heart, so venous return, volume of blood returned to the heart per unit of time, usually it's measured in a minute here. So if you increase your venous return, keep in mind, it's a direct relationship, like I said before earlier in, in the class tonight. Increase the venous return, you're going to increase the stroke volume. Why? Because we're going to get more cross bridge formation because of that overlap here. We're going to get that optimal overlap. So as blood starts to fill the ventricles, it starts to go from here to here to here. Then we get to that sweet spot, and then that's when the heart should contract. Okay, so kind of keep that concept in mind for venous return. Increase venous return, increase stroke volume. Right, our ionotropic agents, this is just showing you the contractility of the heart wall, the myocardium here. So obviously the positive ionotropic agents are going to increase calcium availability so we can get more cross bridge formations. So these muscles here can contract harder, right? And so, or forcibly, they can contract with more force. The more force, right, the more blood that will leave, more blood that leaves, that is our increased stroke volume there. <clears throat> Don't judge me, I'm drinking coffee right now. Okay, because I love it. All right, then finally, the last variable that influences stroke volume is afterload. All right, so afterload, think of it as the resistance, right, to the flow of blood in the arteries resistance of the blood that it's getting ejected out of the heart there. This one has an inverse relationship. If you increase the resistance, you increase the afterload, you're going to decrease the stroke volume here. Right, And so the example I gave you was the atherosclerosis, the placking of the arteries. You have a smaller lumen there for the blood to flow through. You increase that resistance there right? because the lumen becomes more narrow. Therefore, you're going to increase resistance that just makes it harder, right, to get more blood out of the ventricles upon the contraction there. Okay, so that was stroke volume. Okay, so stroke volume, just to remind you, is the difference between end diastolic volume and end systolic volume. Now we have a new, all right, concept to talk about in that, whoops, sorry about that. That is cardiac output. 
Cardiac output, I think I got this down. Cardiac output, nope, is equal to heart rate times stroke volume. You should know this equation. Okay, you should know this equation. So therefore, if we're just using simple mathematics to look at this concept here, if I want to increase my stroke, excuse me, if I want to increase my cardiac output, I can do it a couple of ways. I can increase my heart rate, I can increase my stroke volume, or I can increase both. So if one of those factors, if heart rate increases, you increase cardiac output. If stroke volume increases, you increase uh, uh, cardiac, did I say stroke volume? You, you increase cardiac output. All right, so when we're looking at heart rate, we're, we just talked about this at the end of the last video or class here, the chronotropic agents. So you want to increase the heart rate, you stimulate, if you want to affect the heart rate, then you're going to stimulate the autonomic nervous system, depending on what you want to do. If you want to increase the heart rate, you stimulate the SA node, all right, to increase its firing rate through the sympathetic nervous system. If you want to decrease the heart rate through the parasympathetic nervous system, you can decrease the heart rate, but also remember our bottleneck area, the AV node, okay, we can increase the delay even more there. Therefore, it'll slow down the passage of action potentials and we'll get less depolarization. Therefore, we'll get less muscle contraction there. Stroke volume. Right, like it says here, greatly depends on the state of the myocardium. What does that mean? Cross bridges. Right? What is happening with the wall there? If we increase our venous return, right, more blood is coming in, you're going to get greater stretch on the, the walls of the heart, on the myocardium there. And then what you'll see is you'll get a much, you'll get a, a much more forcible contraction because we're going to increase our cross bridges or overlap there. And then we will then eject more blood. And then with stroke volume two, we're also going to, what influences that is the afterload, the resistance there. And we already talked about that just a few moments ago, right? If your resistance is increased, it will decrease your stroke volume. So if you want to decrease, or excuse me, if you want to increase your stroke volume, then you need to decrease the resistance, the afterload there, right? And we'll see that in older individuals, this is relevant because, right, one, older individuals like myself, our blood vessel walls aren't going to be as uh, uh, accommodating uh, with the blood, so they're a little bit more stiff. So therefore, you'll see an increase in resistance in older individuals. It's wildly crazy. That's one of the reasons, many reasons why they discourage people from smoking, right? Because usually folks that smoke, not for everybody, but usually you'll see an increase in blood pressure, right? In smokers, because they lose that elastic ability there. This is an awesome, this is figure 1929. Uh, I definitely encourage you to take a good look right, at the factors that affect the cardiac output. Start with this, look at this, try to memorize it, but most importantly, try to understand it. So when we look at cardiac output, this down here, right, how much blood is getting pushed out of the heart in the course of a minute, okay, because it's, it's milliliters per minute, Right, which is roughly 5.25 liters per minute. So what is going to affect how much blood that gets pushed out? So now think about it. What is cardiac output on our equation? If you can kind of make out my horrible looking drawing up here, cardiac output is equal to heart rate and stroke volume. So that's what we're going to do here. We're going to work backwards from the bottom up. Here's our heart rate. Here's our stroke volume. So those two factors. So now, all this time, I've been trying to explain to you what affects the variables right, for heart rate and what affects the variables for stroke volume. So for heart rate, 
are chronotropic agents, which we talked about last class. Okay, things that are going to affect the conduction system there. The SA or the AV node. Positive agents will increase, all right, the conduction rate, will increase the um, action potential frequency. So that will increase heart rate. Negative agents, parasympathetic, okay, will decrease the heart rate because that will decrease the firing rate or the action potential firing rate there. And then when we're looking at stroke volume, remember we have three things that influence stroke volume, venous return, ionotropic agents, and afterload. So venous return, direct relationship with stroke volume. You increase venous return, you increase stroke volume, Frank Starling law, okay? Ionotropic agents, right? That influences the calcium availability. How much calcium can we get that's outside of the cell into the sarcoplasm. A couple ways that we can do that. Positive agents are going to allow more calcium into the cell. So they are going to increase the stroke volume. Negative agents are going to decrease the calcium levels inside of the cell. So therefore they will decrease the stroke volume. And then finally, afterload is the resistance in the arteries outside of the heart. And that's an inverse relationship. So if you increase afterload, you are going to decrease stroke volume. So on this slide, you can kind of work it from the bottom up. But kind of everything we've talked about today and a little bit at the end of what I, of last class I was telling you about with the chronotropic agents there, now you can kind of see how these things relate to one another to eventually influence cardiac output. So everything I talked about today basically comes down to this slide here. I, obviously, it's, this is a very general, broad overview of all that. All right. That's the end of that. Um.